The recent increase in kidnappings in the two regions is creating a worrying trend in terms of security. The government has warned that this may further complicate the task of Nigeria's security forces, who are running an extensive operation against both the jihadists in Borno State and against the criminal gangs, also known as the bandits. On the 23rd of July, a memo from Nigeria's immigration chief, Mohamed Babandede, warned of a major movement of bandits from Zamfara in the northwest towards Borno region, who are seeking intensive training by Boko Haram. On Thursday, Nigerian forces killed 78 gunmen during military operations, including airstrikes in northwest Zamfara state. Heavily armed bandits have wrecked northwest and central Nigeria for years, but the groups have recently stepped up attacks on schools, kidnapping hundreds of students for ransom, and prompting a military response. The Nigerian military was first deployed to the area in 2016, and a peace deal with the bandits was signed in 2019, but attacks on communities have continued. Well, for some analysis, we are now joined by Chris Kwaja, lecturer at the Center for Peace and Security Studies at the Modibo Adama University in Adamawa State in Nigeria. Mr. Kwaja, very good evening to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the Globe. Thank you very much. Good evening. Firstly, what's your reading of the escalating incidents of gang and the terror activities in the northwest and central Nigeria? Oh, th thank you very much. It is, it is important uh, for us to understand uh, that Nigeria has been fighting insurgency for over a decade now. Uh, it's 12 years, and uh, this, is a conf this is an insurgency that was perpetrated and perpetuated by Boko Haram. And outside Boko Haram, we've had a mutation of this group. We've had Ansaru, we've had some links uh, of the group with Al-Qaeda in the Maghrib, we've had ISWAP. And the involvement of all this group and the kind of external linkages that Boko Haram have had over time contributed to the lethality and the frequency of the deadly attacks we've seen. Uh, initially, it started as an armed, an armed confrontation with the Nigerian government, particularly the military, uh, the, the, the military security agencies. We saw how it moved to deadly attack against civilian population. And the group took advantage of the softness of the civilian target to launch all the deadly attacks we've seen. Now, presently, we are talking about banditry. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen with banditry is an increase in the nature of attack, which defines a whole lot in terms of sophistication. And that this sophistication is also seen in terms of the number of people uh, that are being killed. We are seeing kidnapping for ransom. We've seen an attack on education, both in terms of the ab abduction of children who are vulnerable uh, to these bandits. And the big question is, is it something that is internal to Nigeria in terms of the security threats, or there are some transnational threats that we cannot phantom in terms of uh, the spread of this uh, banditry? Initially, the banditry was just within Plateau State. It moved to Benue State. We saw Taraba State. We saw some part of Adamawa. Today, we are talking of Zamfara. We are talking of Kaduna, some parts of Sokoto and Katsina State. Now, when it started in Zamfara, the focus was about the mining areas within Zamfara State and that it was a conflict over natural resources, uh, which the, bandit, the bandits were taking advantage of the absence of um, governance in those areas because uh, there were the, the, the amount of security that is, that is required in terms of boots on the ground was so small and they took advantage of that gap in security to now launch attack on vulnerable communities. But we saw a spread, and that the spread we are seeing is a deliberate spread, and that the attacks are with precision. And because of the precision associated with this attack, we are seeing in some ways the semblance of the coordination and 
suffocation of these attacks with what we've seen in the northeast region of Nigeria. And with that kind of connection, it, it means there is more to the whole question of banditry, um, to begin to look at wider issues around the kind of thinking that insurgents, as represented by Boko Haram, is having, uh, whether the northwest region of Nigeria today has become the second front that Boko Haram is opening. And if it is the second front, what do we do in terms of the kind of military partnerships or cooperation or alliances uh, that is required? For now, in the context of the northeast, we have the multinational joint tax force that is on ground. We also have the Nigerian government that have deployed some of its own military personnel within the context of internal security management. They are there to deal with the issues within the Yoruba, Borno, and and the, and the Adamawa axis. But the multinational joint task force is supposed to be a product of partnership between Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon, and Chad, with enough support given by other. Uh, international actors, not necessarily boot on the ground for these international actors like the United Nations, France, UK, and uh, the United Kingdom, but providing some level of technical support that is required. So far, we've seen that it is not enough to militarize the zone in terms of boots on the ground. We need a lot in terms of artificial intelligence, and that the kind of artificial intelligence that is required is something that will really, really require extensive support from the international community, mm -hmm. if at all we need to deal with what we have on ground. It is also important uh, to state that Nigeria is in a very complex situation in terms of the geopolitics of West Africa. Nigeria is in the middle of the Sahel and the Lake Chad. On the part of the Sahel, Mali, Burkina Faso, we've seen, we saw and we've seen what has been happening in those in those countries with respect to incursion by terrorist groups. On the other side of the Lake Chad, Chad, Niger, Cameroon, we are mm. seeing some of the le high level of instability, both from the angle of Central Africa up to North Africa as presented Mr. by Kwaja, what's the, the huge... yeah please allow me to come in there what, what what's the likelihood of the, these gang and the terror activities spilling over into other parts of Nigeria when it comes to matters of national security uh, from a national security standpoint we have a lot to do in terms of what is required for now what we, we are seeing is that Bandits are expanding both in terms of space and the lethality as well as the frequency of the attacks on communities. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few days ago, we saw in just North Central Nigeria, uh, there was an attack on a community. Uh, though that attack has been, there has been conflict within that community between farmers and herders. But the kind of sophistication and lethality that we see that manifest in that kind of attack shows that there is an expansion uh, on the part of the bandits. And as we see what is happening with respect to this expansion, it means other parts of the country are not safe. We've seen in the southeast and okay. the southwestern part of the country some attacks on communities. And the kind of attacks we've seen in those communities are also attacks that takes the form of banditry in terms of okay. uh, the coordinated nature of the attacks. And having said that, is the government winning or losing the war against the jihadists and criminal gangs? And does it actually have a plan um, in place in, 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 in winning up these ways, elements of terror and um, unrest? With what is happening, with, in, uh, with respect to banditry, um, not much has been done with respect to... Uh, the ability of government to deal with that issue. But in terms of insurgency in the Northeast, we've seen we are recording some level of success. And what it tells us is that 
the Nigerian government is facing a huge security dilemma in terms of how it is able to use the limited resources it has, both in terms of the security, the, the military personnel that are supposed to be deployed uh, to these areas, as well as the, 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 the limited capacity it has when it comes to the use of artificial intelligence uh, to deal with this issue. So we have a lot to do in that area, both from the strategic level that requires some deep thinking and tactical level that requires boots on the ground or people on the ground to deal with those issues. I'm, living, I'm using the word people now, not just boots on the ground, yeah. because it is not just enough for government to militarize the space. Community involvement in the fight against banditry and insurgency is very important because in some instances, these bandits, these insurgents take advantage or leverage on some of some okay. kind of connection with the vulnerable communities that they have. The reason, that, that they of, see the reason I've asked the question, Mr. Kwaja, is that uh, Nigeria's immigration chief has warned of a major movement of bandits from Zamfara in the northwest uh, towards Bono region who, who are seeking intensive training by Boko Haram. So how would you sort of characterize a group like Boko Haram and why do you think they hold such an appeal to the bandits? Um, one of for, 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 for students and scholars of terrorism studies, um, they, they know that when it comes to the relationship between communities and bandits or insurgents, the moment you have absence of the state in terms of governance, in terms of the provision of social services, automatically you are providing a safe haven for bandits and insurgents to take advantage of state absence to begin to engage the communities. And we've seen instances where bandits provide, or even the insurgents, provide microcredit support to these communities who see the absence of the states and the presence of Boko Haram as or Boko Haram or bandits as something that they should also take advantage of in order to deal with some of the livelihood challenges that they face. And that is why we have advocated for a whole of government or whole of governance approach to dealing with insurgency. That as you deploy the military, you should begin to look at some social re-engineering policies that will help address the issue of poverty, the issue of inequality, the issue of exclusion, the issue of unemployment, as some of the key pull and push factors that have contributed to the ex, the way and manner terrorists, insurgents, mercenaries, and even bandits recruit and mobilize young men into joining their camps. And what we see right now is a battle between government on one hand and insurgents and bandits on the other hand with communities in the middle. If government is able okay, to provide... We're out of time, unfortunately, Mr. Kwaja. But uh, with regards to the child kidnappings, would you say that the children are being used as political pawns in Nigeria? And if so, to what end? There is a political economy component to the abduction of children. Number one, it is abduction for ransom. People are, being, people are paying huge amounts of money for that. Secondly, children represents soft targets for terrorists and bandits. And because children are involved, they have moved the discourse to a psychological warfare because where children are abducted, automatically you are attacking the psyche of their parents, of their relations, of their communities, who will begin to put pressure on government to do something. And for bandits and terrorists or insurgents, they see that as a huge currency that they can use, they can leverage on in order to take to, to also get to the state. And 
in, 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 in classical war study, war, this is what you call leverage. Bandits are interested in where they can get leverage, and once they get leverage, they hold on to that leverage. And from the Chibok girls' abduction that took place in Borno State down to what we are seeing in Kaduna State, they have discovered that students represent the key leverage that okay. they can use. And, it is and what do these increased activities of uh, terror and gang violence mean for the entire Western African region? In other words, do they pose a threat to the region as a whole? They pose a threat to the region in terms of um, in-country. They pose a threat to the country generally. They pose a transnational threat because as they do this, other terror groups outside Nigeria are also looking at what is happening. And if they discover that the abduction of children represents a key currency for them to gain leverage over the state, this is something that they will do. Right now in Kaduna State, the government have ordered the closure of schools, which in a way has huge implications for the education of the state and the children in particular, okay. because where you are, you, you attack education, you are attacking the future of these children, you are attacking the future of the country. And I think we need to take our minds back to what happened in Rwanda with the genocide, that in the aftermath of the genocide, one of the biggest consequences of that genocide was the impact it had on education. Okay. And as long as schools remain closed, automatically these children will be at home. And Mr. Kwaja, let's leave it there for tonight. Thank you so much for your thoughts and for your reflections on this matter. We do appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Well, that is uh, Chris Kwaja, lecturer at the Center for Peace and Security Studies at the Modibo Adama University in Adamawa State in Nigeria, joining us via Zoom.